Welcome to Life on Life's Terms with Justin <laughs> and Kenny. <laughs> well, for, for today's episode, we're going we're gonna to learn about some of our failed past experiences in business and what we, what we learned from those failed experiences, uh, business relationships, how we made them, how we kept them. And then we're going to talk about finding and keeping the motivation to live this uh, self-starter lifestyle. But first, Kenny's going to do a shout out for our wonderful sponsor, Ono Poke is a chef-driven, fast, casual restaurant serving Hawaii's signature dishes. The menu features chef-curated poke bowls. Customers can select various bases for bowls, including fur cake rice, quinoa, and spring salad, along with vegetable seasoning and protein options such as torched miso salmon poke, the albacore tuna, and the spicy Thai salmon poke. Or you can build your own bowl. Ono in Hawaiian means delicious. And that's absolutely what it is. You can find Ono Poke downtown Edmonton, 10142 104 Street, or Google it. They're all over the place. Our second sponsor is Modern Gravity. It's the best place to relax with their spacious float tanks. If you have not floated, you have to try this. Absolutely have to try this. February is always a stressful month for everybody. For only $39.99 a month, you can enjoy a float a month and let it all go. Just let it all float away. So if you're interested in this, please go to Modern Gravity's website, www.moderngravity.ca. Done. That's it. It's Boom. All, that's it. It's finished. It's finished. <laughs> uh, so past, so obviously a lot of our business, past businesses, uh, failed. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, and this is the big dark thing that I think a lot of, um, other people don't want to talk about is, so we, you and I had in a past episode called failures and successes. Yeah. But what I think we, what, what I think uh, a lot of people don't want to talk about, like I said, the big dark thing is what you learned from those failures or supposed failures, because I don't, I don't really see many failures. What I really see is learning experience or past attempts. And then those attempts became what they are, like what they are today in regards to a learning venture. Right. Yeah. Um, So premise for me. So I went to, I went to school and got uh, fairly educated in my time, but I don't agree with education now. So when I went into the not-for-profit sector, right. uh, I went and worked at many, many different places in order to, learn what the not-for-profit sector is. I honestly believe that this way of the way of universities and the way of education is gone. And if you look at any entrepreneurs out there, segue to this, is most who are successful never finish school. None of them have. Most of them understand, uh, just like our, our, our guest yesterday, understand, or your guest yesterday, understands what it is to be hungry. And how to stay hungry, you know? Yeah. And I think that's that's a huge contributing factor, right? Uh, real quick, I like to touch on Warren Buffett. Warren Buffett, who's one of the most richest men in the world, if he if the market is a struggling market, he tells his wife to only put a dollar fifty in his pocket because that's all he can afford for breakfast that day. <laughs> like that's nuts, <laughs> right? A dollar fifty, and then he goes to McDonald's. <laughs> and he, he orders whatever he's going to order at McDonald's for a dollar fifty, you know. And and then when it, when the markets are good, he gets his wife to give him three seventy five. Oh shit! You know exactly <laughs> right. And, w- and when it's in the middle, he gets two dollars and fifteen cents for 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 bre- uh, for breakfast. You know, so staying hungry is very very important. I think that's the same thing as a fighter. Fighters always have to stay hungry if even when they become the champ. You know. Um, so let's get into some of those failed things that we've learned. Yeah, after you just said that, I was looking for that picture that I took of your shoes that one day. Oh, yeah. Yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Like to me, uh, Justin, it, like he knows his shit about money and he's a financial advisor, right? And he he's not the richest, but he he knows more than I do and our bank statements prove that. So 
one day I walk into the studio and this guy's got these shoes on with holes in it and like his toes sticking out the end and these things are rattered and tattered and he's like, what? I love these shoes. What are you talking about? And I'm like, fuck, bro, you sure live a humble life, like considering. And he's like, hey, you got it, man. Look at all the other rich guys. That's what they do too. <laughs> I, I think it's one of those things too where you have to you have to remember. It's like this, right? Rich people didn't keep their money because they spent it all. Yeah. They kept it because they're still shopping at Value Village or Goodwill or wherever the hell it is. It's that not they... Value Village. It's Valu Village. Yeah, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> what, what, whatever thrift store that you can go to, right? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I think I think that's one of, one of those attributes that we all have to keep. We have to – that kind of keeps you grounded. You Attribute know? you have to keep. That's something I need to learn. To Well, you know how you can always tell a poor man? They got nice clothes. They spend more than they need to. Yeah, that's that's the honest to God truth. Yeah, my you, life story. You will right now. always, you will always see. So poor people, and I, I, I mean, I, I tip well now, but I tip within my means. Okay, before, when I was a blue collared working guy, so to say, uh, in the bush. So I worked in the oil field. I would tip fifty, sixty dollars for for a dinner because I. I had this bravado about making all this money in the oil field, and this is what I was giving these waitresses. Yeah. Right? Um, was that within my means? No. When I became a party chief, so like an actual crew, like the crew chief, Yeah. Um, I learned a little bit more about money, and I recognized that you know $50 every time I sit down for dinner is like I might as well be getting drunk every night. That's because, a lot of money. Because yeah. I'm, I'm blowing about $80, $90 a night on dinner, right? And I still have to buy lunch the next day. And breakfast and all these meals in order to get to work. Right? Some days I only make a hundred dollars in a day. <laughs> so, so that that was that was a big deal when I when I recognized it. But you will always recognize, and and this is this is if you're one of these people, this is the casualty is that if you're spending in order to be in bravado, yeah, right, like like to be to be something of somebody, then what you what you're missing out on is is uh what i would say that you're missing out on is you're not you're not miss you're missing out on being honest with yourself that's yeah. that's that's the key right there right because if you're not if you're not being honest with yourself about where you really are and you keep on living this fantasy your lie is going to implode on you right so yes i agree with that but i also disagree with that in the sense because like I've I've read books like The Millionaire Mindset. Sure. And in there, or like often uh, Bob Proctor will talk about having a, a rich person's mindset mm -hmm. and don't adjust your spending habits to your, uh, or don't adjust your quality of life to your income. Adjust your income to the quality of life. hundred percent. So I, go out and make more money. Don't spend less. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Yeah. I mean, I I totally agree with that. So that's what I'm doing, but I'm broke still. But but this, <laughs> this, this is the idea. So let's use that with Warren Buffett. Yeah. Warren Buffett is a hundred, billions, yeah. billions and billions of dollars. He still only has $1.75 for breakfast. Why? Because he's not spending outside of his means of where he started from. You yeah. see that? That's that's the point. It's not about exorbiting yourself more or getting more. Sure, we all deserve more. Look at The Rock. Ro the Rock is a perfect example. This guy has a moving gym. And I mean a moving gym. This thing is massive. Yeah. Okay? But why does he have it? Well, it's a tool for him to be in the physical fitness that he's in in order to sell himself. He's an actor. Yeah. He's, a, he's a wrestler. He needs this in order for him to look good. This isn't something, sure, he enjoys it, and that's fantastic. But this isn't something that's out of his realm. It's a tool. If you need a tool for your job that costs you $100,000, go get the loan to get it because you'll make the money back. Yeah. Okay. So that's how he's looking at the gym. But you look at The Rock's clothes. Sure, he's got a nice suit on, so on and so forth. He can afford that. But look at what he eats. You know, he's still drinking the same uh, nutritious uh, nutri uh, nutrient powder that he's been drinking his entire life. His spending habits for what he needs is still at the same amount as before. Sure, he can uh, he can afford a, a a nice 
piece of jewelry or, or whatever, whatever that he's, he's complimenting himself with, as I'm sure Warren Buffett does as well. But the point is, is what keeps you humble is what is, what do you need to spend every day? Do you, do you have to go to Holt and Renfrew to buy a suit or can you go to Moore's? Yeah. Do you have to have a Calvin Klein suit or can you buy a knockoff to look like that in the moment? Because this is what I find. There's more value in, in appreciating the person who I'm becoming than the person who I am right now. Oh, per- wow. I'm person who I down. am. I'm going to write that down, bro. That's gold. The, the person who I am is only a casualty of yesterday. The person who I'm becoming is going to get me to tomorrow, right? So where did I learn? That was through a failed business plan that I got that mentality. Because the, what it, the business that had failed was a business that was uh, a consulting piece that I wanted to put together for hiking trails and stuff. Right. So one of the things that I was always told is find out what you like to do and just stick to that. Yeah. Well, I really, really enjoy hiking, but unfortunately the rest of the world doesn't enjoy hiking as much as I enjoy hiking. So it's, it's a very, very difficult uh, market to get into being a social media person and talking about hiking unless you have. Unless like, you uh, live at, live in Banff or something. Well, you can always get there. It's, it's basically this. There's, there's contracts for Canada anyways. I don't know about America, but for Canada, there's contracts that come up from cultural, culture, cultural and tourism ministry that will pay you $40,000 a year to go and do this. Take pictures of you hiking, all this stuff. And then you post it. But you have to be a pretty serious social media guru like you need a good following to get into that so that you can basically sell alberta to all these people yeah okay that's what you're attracting yeah right um the government i mean these these contracts go out all the time and they switch it up every two years because that's how long the the grant is actually eighty thousand dollars and it's divided amongst two years for forty thousand dollars and then they actually pay you for your kilometers the government doesn't want Mm -hmm. you to know this kind of stuff because one of the big things about it is that uh, they want to make it look like it's organic, right? Like it's just people who are just doing this. But the reality is they're getting paid. Sure, they probably love it. Anyways, I digress. What I'm getting at is it was a failed business plan because... Market research, lack of it. Uh, it wasn't really the market research. It was more my, my mentality. Because what I ended up realizing is one, my competitor was the government right that that was that's an issue that's not a good competitor no you you never you're never going to beat the government in canada and then the second one was my mentality was i was i couldn't put i wasn't pushing it forward like i was always resting upon well i've been here and i've been there and this is a great trail and and this and that and and whatever i wasn't venturing into the unknown i wasn't walking into the void going i've never been on this trail let's go film this one Right. That, that didn't, that I wasn't doing that. So like when I was doing the preamble to the trail, I was always starting off saying, I've already been here. Well, why don't I talk about a place where myself and the other person, which would be listeners or viewers or whoever, we're going to experience this for the first time together. Yeah. Right. That makes way more sense than me talking about the, the, the piece or the, or the trail prior to actually going out there. So that I really learned that in that moment, thinking to myself, well, you know, it's great to have a trail report, but who the hell's really going to look at it? Cause that's basically what it was. It was a trail report. And there's a guy out there named Marty who's pretty successful at it, uh, in the bush. Marty, I think is, is his channel page or something like that. Um, anyways, he's pretty successful at it. He gets a quite a bit of views, but he never, if you look at his videos, he never starts off saying, I've already been on this trail, right? Uh, so so that, that was a big deal that I, that I kept, uh, really taught me that the person that I'm becoming is far more superior of a, of a, of a mentality than thinking about what I am. Because what I am really is nothing but what I'm going to be tomorrow, right? So it, it helps me perpetuate forward. As opposed to staying in the same place. I liked what you said there about the uh, about the void, and uh, it like you know going on that new journey and being in that uncomfortable state and treading in unknown territory and waters. 
and uh, I just took this little note. In business, just like meditation, you get results when you enter the void. For sure. For sure. With with a taste of pragmatism. You, you have to know enough about the basic business structure, such as incorporation, so on and so forth, so you don't get yourself into a legal jam. See, this is the thing, right? So we, we almost, I was almost going to bring a lawyer on, a, a corporate lawyer on the show to, to talk a little bit about this, because this was a lot of back to my failed business attempts. Where I failed mostly was not in the idea. I'm, I mean, I'm a true entrepreneur at, at heart. I mean, I, I can come up with a thousand different ideas of business because my mind is moving like 90 seconds a minute or like it feels like 90 thoughts in a minute is what I mean to say, right? Yeah, more than that. But yeah. so, so, so that's that's what it feels like all of the, like there's an explosion in my brain all of the time is what it feels like when I'm, when I'm thinking about what can happen or, or different markets, so on and so forth. It's just, it's just the way how my brain is. But where I was, where I would always struggle was one, how do I incorporate? And when I did try to incorporate on my own without a lawyer, I mucked it up all of the time. And then the next thing is writing policy and procedure manuals for my employees. I mucked that up all of the time because I didn't know what the hell I was doing, right? Then I didn't know the process of how to make an independent entity. And this was, I was a huge casualty of almost getting paralyzed from starting anything because I realized that I would have to incorporate it. And then, I mean, I guess this is my mentality is I realized that I didn't like being weak in that way. So I decided that I had to start reading. Just like when you and I catch a case back in times, how many, how many times did you read the law book about different cases and defenses, so on and so forth? I mean, we, only once. But, but I bet but you it was, I a, it was a big case. Yeah. You know what yeah. I mean? It's, I was looking at losing years. Yeah, like it wasn't. It wasn't. It's not jailhouse. It's not jailhouse lawyer, lawyering. You actually know. I mean, and when you read that thing, it's pretty cut and clear what your defense attorney can do and what he can't do. Yeah, it's it's pretty. So if you read that prior to talking to your lawyer, so I'm gonna break this down too. When you talk to a lawyer, tip of the fucking day here. One, when you get arrested, shut your fucking mouth. Don't say a goddamn thing. Nothing. Tip two, <laughs> tip two, when you're talking to your lawyer, go look at the fucking legal book before talking to your lawyer because your lawyer is an officer of the court. And if you admit guilt, even to your defense attorney, they cannot perjure themselves in court and they're going to feed you to the fucking judge. You, you never do that. Even if you were guilty as sin, you're, you will notice your lawyer will never ask you, well, are you guilty? They don't want to know. Because no. the less that they know, the less likely they are to perjure themselves in court. And being an officer of the court, defense is an officer of the court, they cannot lie in court. They can't do that. Yeah. So shut your fucking mouth. You know, Find out what his defense can be. And if you're guilty of sin, stay within those parameters. And if you are not guilty, then get up on the fucking stand. If you're not. If you are guilty, you avoid that like it's the plague. You just you just stay away. Anyways, that's my legal tip of the day. Because I'm, I'm, maybe I'm dealing with a guy who just can't keep his fucking mouth shut. <laughs> he just, <laughs> just keeps getting fucking. He just keeps getting nailed. And like, well, then he's got some more lessons to learn. Well, he's got to stop using meth and then getting arrested. Because as soon as he uses meth and gets arrested, his fucking mouth is like a thousand miles an hour and just keeps talking. Like and he's just digging himself in a hole. When right? you get a, when cops arrest you, they are not helping you. No, no, <laughs> not not then. They are there to arrest you and put you so, in jail. So again, is that a catalyst of of failed business plans? For sure, it is. Um. So yeah, like I said, my my mind is always that of if it's a weakness, I need to learn it. So I just started reading. Yeah. And I started reading every what the difference is between a not profit incorporation and a for profit incorporation. And then there's a, a gray area that we have here in Canada where you can be for profit with a social bone, basically. It's very underutilized um, because it's a very difficult incorporation to get. What is that called? I forget what it's called off of the, ho- the top of my mind, but that's basically the definition of it. Like I said, not many people use it because it's very, very difficult to get that incorporation. Well, I'm actually. I'll talk after. Because one of the issues that ends up happening is when you look at your incorporation, that's actually what shoehorns you in Canada. So if you're a not-for-profit, what you're not allowed to do is 
distribute funds to your board members. All of your board members in a not-for-profit have to be there in a voluntary capacity, and they're not allowed to be paid dividends in order to sit on that board, nor are they allowed to be paid honorariums to sit on that board. Unless you're in a different structure, such as Aboriginal structure, they can actually those board members can take an honorarium depending on what they're doing. There, there are gray lines, but that's pretty cut and bl- uh, cut clear and blank. Um, people who can get paid from not for profits, of course, are are, are uh, operation managers yeah. and and uh, employees. That's that's basically who can get paid by by not for profits and executive directors. Executive directors can be to a degree. You want to be very careful with that title depending on what the bylaws say because the bylaws may say that directors are not allowed to be paid right so second and it becomes very semantical <clears throat> um but the the government is known they don't they won't really slap your hands about it but they they may do certain things and then when you're a for-profit uh, life is actually a heck of a lot easier you just have your income tax and your gst number so you have your gst number and you have your income tax to to report every month and uh, you operate the same way as any other business, just as a not-for-profit does when you do payroll. You know, uh, your policy procedure manuals have to fall in line with the government. And uh, there's many, many programs out there that will do a walkthrough with you on how to do that. I personally am more inclined to hire contractors than I am inclined to hire employees. Uh, it keeps your it keeps your your secretary it keeps your secretary's job nice and easy. You know, there's no layoffs that way. You just don't hire them again for the next bit of work that you have. Uh, you don't have to worry about their taxes for income, any of that stuff. Right. So that's kind of nice as well. That's how we're set up here at life on life's terms. I mean, you're a contractor essentially into life on life's terms. And so am I, that's, that's basically how that works at the end of the day. Right. So in that corporate structure, it makes a heck of a lot of difference. especially in media. So like, let's say you said something off color, off collared or off color. (laughs) Um, And we had to let you go because your opinions are of your own responsibility. It's no reflection on life on life's terms. Um, We could let you go without a severance package. That's, and that's the same thing with the bloggers, right? Essentially that's how that works. It allows you that separation right away. Right, especially in today's world where you write something and it's forever and there's no omission anymore, like there used to be in a newspaper. You know, um, it's there forever. So, so that's one of the tricks of the trade for sure when it comes to media and hiring other people. Uh, and then, of course, there's always profit sharing, which is which is a really nice way of paying everybody as opposed to having to come up with payroll. So, if you don't have payroll starting a business. Um, you may want to do profit sharing where they take a, a portion of this sale, that sale, this endorsement, this, that, or the other thing. Then it comes up to a full rounded number and everybody's working for themselves, especially when it comes down to uh, contractors and profit sharing. You'll see people work harder. It's kind of like the idea of, uh, of being a salesperson in, a, in, in the automotive sector, right? If you're a car salesman at a dealership, you get a prof, you get a percentage of the profit and you are essentially a contractor in that, in that environment. You know what I mean? You can hire your own secretary, so on and so forth. If you really, really wanted to. And I'm, I think most of those contracts too, it's subject to the person who is the manager of the dealership. So again, where did I learn all this stuff from my failures, right? Where I kept failing was the incorporations act of Canada and I kept failing in setting up policy and procedure and what's the easiest way to, to get something up and going and so on and so forth because I'm a pitcher. Like that's that's what I am. I'm I'm the guy who can get in front of five five hundred people to a thousand people and be so passionate about an idea that you'll probably go down the same line with me. You yeah. know what I mean? Like like that's that's my gift, right? Um I can sell air to, to you breathing right now. You know, that's if, if I'm passionate about it and I really care about it. You know, I'm not a snake, snake oil salesman. I have to actually like what I'm talking about, you know, or, or have an interest in it. What's one of uh, like a past business idea that you really put a lot of effort into, but you never actually 
committed fully to it and it never happened. Do you have any of those? Because I got yeah, one. I yeah. Got one. So I had a website that I really wanted to set off as a porn site, actually. <laughs> um, live. It was live sex. Good Christian. Well, this was before then. <laughs> so it was live sex because I was transitioning from, I was trying to get out of all of my drug dealing and go straight into pimping and basically put all those eggs into that carton. Yeah. But one of the things that I recognized is that um, backpage.com is going to get shut down at some point. And that's like, so I had three levels of prostitutes. I had prostitutes that were on the street, kind of. And then I had some in a hotel. And then I had some that were high, high rollers, right? Um, so my high rollers were easy in regards to most of them didn't get fucked because the the just the nature of the date, right? Um, the girls in the hotels, of course, it was like a lineup, right? But where's the avenue to showcase them on a forum? It was all on back page except for the high-end rollers because it was basically high-end rollers. I would go meet the client myself with, a, with basically, I was a solicitor in, in the context of showing these girls and then these guys would actually call these girls and then that's how that's how it was facilitated basically so i didn't actually facilitate the meeting itself right um and then these other girls i basically was a financial support just paying the room i'd pay the room i'd pay for their cell phones and all that stuff and they would give it was basically a loan every week is how it was working yeah right but what i started seeing is that it was better to have an in like a website uh, structure because in Ontario prostitution is legal, like in Ontario, Canada. So that's that's where I was when I was doing a lot of this stuff, and um, yeah. So I had thought, well, it's probably better to be on a website that's worldwide and facilitate this this way, still with live sexual acts happening in the moment, because we can get. Like there could be income being generated from people watching that. Yeah. And I was just too messed up on drugs. Yeah. To really make that business move. Yeah, you can connect all the dots to actually yeah. get it going, yeah. And, you know, there's probably a stigma about me at the time too. So to, in order to be in the legitimate world, you need legitimate people around you. Yeah, you need relationships. So, of course, like I said, a lot of this ended up not happening because it was the... Th well thought out plan written down the whole piece yeah but people were too scared to do business with you and and not just that i didn't have the wherewithal to really make it work you know yeah, what i mean you like, had a general idea and you put it down on paper and you can sell it in you could pitch it yeah but that's all it was yeah and was i pitching it to anybody worthy not really yeah you know i i have a i have a business plan that i I literally, like, I started doing it in jail, and I I was uh, basing it off of like a business book that I wrote, mm -hmm. uh, like Mavericks Businesses or something like that. Yeah. And they talked about like Starbucks, and they talked about like uh, ING. Oh yeah, yeah. And uh, these different Maverick businesses that like set the path, like went out, thought outside of the box came up with a different like culture and theme and they had purpose mm -hmm. and I used that kind of like set of information out of that book to really like formulate a good plan about a detox center uh, and my main service was going to be colon hydrotherapy yeah. and like I came up I with a brand a, a, like a label a logo uh, I, I even did like a floor plan like to scale yeah um and I like I ha still have it at home, and it's probably I probably got maybe a hundred pages ish yeah. of uh, of content. The, w the only thing that was missing out out of it for like actual business plan, like there's market research, there's uh, the only thing that was missing was like the financial aspect of it, like the mm -hmm. crunching the numbers. Mm -hmm. But uh, <clears throat> that's still something that I intend to do, and I was in a, I was in a good mind space when I wrote that. Like I was one hundred percent yeah. sober, you know, and like I just went through my first round of colon hydrotherapy, and I I felt the effects of it, and yeah, I yeah. knew it, so I was like super passionate about it. Yeah. But just like you, at the same time, when I got out, 
I didn't have the professional network to pitch it to. All I still had was gangsters and criminals, and these guys weren't really interested in, in investing in a butthole cleaning company. Well, and I guess, and I think that's the other thing too, When and this I see a lot, a lot from entrepreneurs coming up, a lot, is they piss their time away in things that don't matter when they're trying to build their plan. You know, the thing that matters is when, when you're sitting across the table from anybody, anybody that is worthwhile to invest in, is they're going to say, okay, so what do you have in the warehouse, so to say? Well, you know, you, you got this and that or whatever. Okay, so are you incorporated? Yeah, okay. So you're incorporated. Then they're going to say, okay, so how many employees do you have to move that warehouse? And you say, you know, two or three. And then the next thing they're going to say is, okay, so what's my return of investment, my ROI? So if I give you $60,000, what's, what's the return on that? And what's the, what's the time? So you have to know before, they don't give a shit. They don't give a fuck what it looks like. They don't give a shit what, what the, like they don't give what's, a what's fuck a good, about any of that. What's a good uh, ROI? Like when you're making your pitch. So like if, if I'm pitching, the, so if I'm the guy who's investing, right? Um, so I'm giving somebody 10 grand. 10 grand is pretty low, yeah, I probably want that. I can look at that on long term or short term, but I probably want that back on a short term. So if I'm giving somebody ten grand, I want them to be paid up uh, in sixteen months, seventeen months, and I'm probably gonna want a ten grand. I'm gonna probably want either a fixed number or I'm gonna want or I'm gonna want uh, a percentage. So I want a percentage. I'm probably looking at something better than the bank at like seven percent, right? So it's kind of like loan sharking in that moment. Yeah. Right. Or I'm going to say for 10 grand, I want $23,000 back. Right. That's, that's what I want. So I want 13,000 on top of my 10. That's right? craziness. I mean, well, that's not 7% or no. Or the other thing I could say is I'm buying in for $10,000. I want shares. Right. So it all depends on where I'm going and what I think. So if, if I don't really like the idea, that's when I'll probably say I want twenty three thousand for my ten. Because yeah, I don't want in. Because you don't want in, and if I really, they, I really if don't they want take it. it, then it's like, well, well I'm doubling my money. Yeah. So. so whatever. Yeah. Can I? And then the next question to myself is, can I afford to lose ten thousand dollars? Yeah. Right. Because if this schmuck is taking it, for that kind of, I might even back out at the end because I'd be like, you're an idiot. Yeah. Right. Like I'm making yeah. three thousand dollars. <laughs> I'm making thirteen thousand dollars off ten. Instead, I could have said. Here's 10 grand. You're going to pay me. You're going to pay me, you know, $5,000 every quarter for the next five quarters or whatever. Right. And get that money back that way. Right. I, I, there's so many different ways that you can break it down. Now, if I'm pitching and return of investment, so I want to look at what my generated income is coming in. And how much of a percentage I'm able to throw at them in order to pay them off in a timely manner. Without sinking yourself. That's right. So like if I'm looking for $60,000 from an investor, $60,000 is a lot of money. So I may want to look at trying to, like we had discussed in the last episode about generating an investors group, right? So I generate an investors group and I have six or seven people who can throw in eight or ten thousand dollars a piece so if they can throw in eight or ten thousand dollars a piece then i'm going to look at what my overall income is come what my overall income is and then by looking at that then i'm going to figure out well can i give them two or three percent so then that determines whether i'm selling them or i'm i'm negotiating for them to be part owners or am i negotiating it as a loan right if i'm negotiating it as a loan it's going to be a higher profit margin right? That's what I have to give them. I have to give them a higher profit margin in order for them to give me what's called a bridge loan or a short-term loan, right? If I want them to buy in as owners, well, then they have to see that there's going to be an exponential growth over amount of time. And if they can't see that, well, then I, they're out. You know, I just wasted everybody's time, right? And it's not about, this is the pragmatism or being pragmatic about your own business, it's if you want to practice this, how honest are you with yourself? What's your moral mirror? 
right? Can you separate, can you separate yourself from, from your ego or from any of, any of that bullshit that supposedly makes you? Can you look at yourself and say, I humbled myself this morning. I got physical activity. I was emotionally stable and I could be of service without bias. Being of service without bias means that you're not doing something to get something from somebody and you're not keeping an inventory of what you're doing for somebody. You're just fucking doing it. Okay. That's what it means. So if you can keep that honesty with yourself, this is the way to practice this because then when you go to look at your business, you're not going to be that idiot who's willing to sink with the ship and hold on until it hits the bottom of the ocean. Or you're not, you're also not going to be the idiot who's ready to abandon the ship because it hasn't been fixed. It's just, it's just a little, little hole. You didn't blow the whole entire keel out of the damn thing. You know what I mean? If you, so in regards to reflecting that back to yourself, it's this. So you may have a behavior that you don't, don't really particularly like. So if that's the case, what you may want to do is you want to, you may want to look at that and say to yourself, okay, do I have to throw that away entirely or can I tweak it so that it becomes better? Is it something that's good? Like for instance, I, I get up at five o'clock every morning, four thirty, five o'clock every morning. And I hated it in the beginning. I still today, man, I still don't like it, you know, but I have to ask myself, is this a good habit or is this a bad habit? What are the pros and the cons of that habit? Now think about that as your business. That's your business. First, you have to learn how to run you as a business before you can look at any other business alternative or any business opportunity out there. Right? So, Again, what are your failed business experiences? That's, that's a huge deal, man. Like if you can find something that you learned out of your business experiences, well, then you're halfway to being an entrepreneur because most of us are half full glass kind of people. We're not half empty kind of people. You know, we're always looking for the optimism and what we're doing, but you have to be pragmatic. You got to be grounded in reality. Yeah. You got to be an opportunist. Yeah. You got to well, see opportunity in, in different areas. And, and what I think like separates entrepreneurs from everybody else is that when they see something like say it's a fridge, they just see a fridge. They're like, well, you can sell that fridge on Kijiji. You can part it out. You can friggin' use it in a restaurant. You can do yeah. whatever. Like you have to be able to use your imagination and come up with, you have to be like industrious and, and uh, resourceful in the random shit that pops up throughout the day. What is the biggest thing you ever learned from a failed business from the past? Um, well, don't put all your eggs in one basket is one. <laughs> right. Um, so what business was that, that you, that where you learned that? Uh, like before, like one of the first businesses I, I had like legitimate businesses was like that hot dog cart. Yeah. That I talked about, about that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And like I sunk all my money into buying this hot dog cart. And then at so, the time. So let me ask you before, before we go further, what I want to ask you is, was that thing incorporated? Was that business incorporated? Did no, you... I didn't even incorporate that shit. I just winged it. I was just, I didn't get it like certified by by uh, health and safety, health and safety or nothing. So watch like, this. I'm gonna I'm gonna show you something that that could have happened. Oh, I know okay. it's it's super high risk. It's like selling drugs. No, no, I could have got shut down and fined and Sh been super in the hole. Sure, that that's worst case. I'm gonna tell you the 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 positive to this. Now knowing what you know about incorporating, remember how you said you lost it, you got it. Yeah, you know. yeah, I went through an intersection too fast and like the barbecue part, the welds on it broke and the barbecue so, fell off and then a car hit it. So let's <laughs> say for $1,000, you got all your paperwork in order and then that accident still happened. You could have wrote it off to your insurance company and you would have got all that money back that you had spent on all that equipment. Yeah, I would have got brand new shit probably. You no, know, they wouldn't have replaced it. They would have just given you the cash. Yeah. Had they given you the cash and you're like, this hot dog thing isn't me. You then still I, have that money to go and put into something else now. Yeah. Right? That's the, that is why it's go, you're golden to incorporate because then you can get insurance. You're above board. And you're right. Uh, Alberta Health could have totally whacked your hands and it's a $15,000 $15, fine. Right? But at the end of the day, 
the way how I see it is your ignorance towards the job in, in regards to regulating it the right way actually cost you because now everything was written off because there was no insurance. Yeah. Right? Yeah. That's a huge learning curve in itself. Right? How many times, how many times have we go in, especially in the old ways that we were, go into legitimate businesses and fucked it up and it was a complete loss with no payout because we didn't even incorporate it. Yeah. And we didn't do our due diligence. Like that's like the mandatory you know, like get that paperwork. Well, both you and I came up like anti-systematic. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. I still look at like uh, paying taxes is difficult to pay. Yeah, if I get I do. somebody's like, "Oh, <laughs> you got to fill out this form," and they slide me across a piece of paper with blank spaces on it, I get fucking anxiety. Still to this day, <laughs> it's like the hardest thing for me to do is to fucking fill out a form. Yeah, because I'm like, you know, when you're when you're illegitimate, everything you do is like. I can't leave a paper trail. I got to fucking cover my tracks. Yeah. Fuck. What that. name did I give them? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. What a tangled web we weave. Yeah. <laughs> and and again, this is back to the reflection of your of yourself. How are you living your life? Is your life honest? You have to You know, I'm not I'm not saying to anybody, look at if you're not living this way, don't jump into a self-starter lifestyle. What I'm saying is, you need to start practicing now. How honest are you, you with yourself? I'm not talking about beating the shit out of yourself with honesty. I'm talking about saying to yourself, look it, Justin, you're obese. You need to go to the gym. Okay, let's go to the gym. That's, that's accepting the positive consequence of saying to myself, Justin, you're, you're obese. You need to do something about this. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, relationships. What's the best relationship you've made in business? from the past that's still today and how did you keep how did how did you keep that that relationship um i have a friend who i used to go into little things with like buying a lot of percocets or mm-hmm. you know we would like kind of like mentor each other you know he's like illegitimate so like you said before when you were a drug dealer you wanted to capitalize on the opportunity of being a drug dealer. So you sold all drugs so you can get to the whole market. Uh, This individual and I are kind of like the same where, you know, if we're going to be criminals and, and break the law or like do things illegitimately with no paper trail to make money and not pay taxes, then we're going to be like uh, serial entrepreneurs in a sense. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, we're going to have, we're going to, uh, go into like a car stealing ring together with a fucking yeah, yeah. Uh, shop uh, that strips it all and, and parts it out. And we're also going to have on this side of the fence, we're going to have a, uh, a, co- a copper racket where yeah, yeah. we have these guys getting copper for us and we get a cut on that. And then we're going to have something with uh, prostitution. We're going to have a, a couple gay guys and a couple girls doing their thing over here and we're going to yeah. help them set something up. And me and this individual, like we went into like lots of different, half-ass partnerships where we kind of just piece each other out but like now today uh we're both legitimate and still we still practice this same routine where we uh look for different ideas and then we banter back and forth and bounce these ideas back off each other and then you know we use each other's creative spark and energy to fucking propel ourselves forward in these new ideas and we we still take risks together but the risks are more calculated and they don't end up with silver handcuffs silver bracelets <laughs> yeah 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 i think that's always uh i think that's always the casualty when we're in that in that field of business so to say is is uh the likelihood that the police will take everything away from you. Yeah, there's you know? no security. And uh, that's what I tell a lot of these people now because I still have a, a big connection to these people that are in jail because we do the bail program things, right? Yeah. Uh, they're different. He, like, we don't work together at the same thing, but we're doing the same thing, like helping people. To a degree, yeah. To a degree, yeah. And uh, so I still have to speak to these individuals on a regular basis and, you know, telling them that, like, you know, invest your time into something where you're not going to lose 
everything because like when you're legit, you never lose everything because there's insurance and there's this and that. Well, and, and even if you do lose everything, you can fucking claim bankruptcy and just live poor for seven years and then get your credit re- re- straightened out. And one of the other things is too, is a lot of what I hear a lot of is people say, well, I don't have the time to put into myself. I need to make money now. Well, look at you're not going to make money if you don't put the time into yourself. No, you'll stay at that dollar amount, like you're, that average you're, you're, income. You're, and this is how you learn. This is hard knocks of business. You can't, uh, you cannot hire out of college a kid who's hungry. You, you just, you're just not going to find. The likelihood of you finding it is that one in a thousand, you know, one in a million. If you just go and find somebody who's hungry and foster that, foster that, that relationship, um, you're going to find 10 of them. You know, that's, that's just the way it is. You got to go, you got to go to where people are hungry, you know? You, you don't find a boxer in, uh, you don't find a boxer in, in, in like Fifth Avenue, New York. It's not where you find them. You want to find a boxer, you go to like Jamaica like, Avenue, yeah, you, you know? You, you, go to, you, go to, you go to the hood yeah, you, where you, guys grew up you, fighting. You, you, go to Queen, <laughs> you go to Queensbridge. You know what I mean? That's, that's where you're going to find them. You know, you, you don't go, you, you don't find a fighter in like downtown Toronto. You find a fighter out in Mississauga. You know, if you want to find a business guy who knows how to create business and, 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 and is willing to go to bat, I mean, go to bat. Those are the people who you, who, who you have to foster, you know? Um, I think one of the best business relationships I ever, ever had, I cannot say that I had any from the past that are generated today. I don't, I don't have them. Um, a lot of them have been pushed out for the most part, um, I don't pay them. There's, there's nothing, there's nothing there. Uh, the best business relationship I've ever met in my life, uh, is a guy actually who's coming in next week on the show. So I don't want to sink my ship here. Knock on wood that he, that he comes in. Um, but he's, he's one of these guys, he runs a ton of businesses and, uh, the law of, of attraction definitely, uh, was there between him and I meeting, because we're both very, very gun ho about the businesses that we're into. Uh, our minds think very, very much alike. And within one session of sitting with this guy, we will we can come up with 10 viable business opportunities. And th- this is probably what we're going to showcase in next week's show is between me and this other guy is business ideas for you guys to utilize as the listeners and it's it's it, it will basically be a free a free for all of ideas and how to incorporate and the whole bit uh i mean over the last two shows if we want to recap really i i spoke about how to get a room together to pitch for your own your own investors group that you have nourished you have generated uh, and 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 how to get that together, and then even in this episode, basically you and I talked about policy and procedure in a very roundabout way. Yeah, and it wasn't so like have you ever sat in a business seminar? You might as well shoot yourself in the fucking head. Like it, th- those guys are so dry, you know, they're so yeah. dry, and they do it like systematically, <laughs> textbook yeah. and shit. And and it, that's the shit. That's cookie cutter businesses, man. Like and and you and I kind of kind of like I went into the straight process of what it is. And I even said like anybody who's, who you're looking at as an investor, they don't give a shit uh, what the fucking place really looks like. They, they don't give a fuck. They don't give a fuck what the name is. They don't give, they don't give two shits, even really what you're fucking selling. All they care about is how much is coming in and how much is going out. That's all they care about at the end of the day. You know, they, you, you, you're going to sell the guy when you're passionate about what you're sell, what, what you're pitching, so to say. All that guy knows is that you're going to pay him at the end of the day because you love doing what you do. He didn't give a shit what you're fucking pitching. He doesn't give a shit what you're selling. He doesn't. He, he doesn't give two fucks, man. He really does. He doesn't give a shit if it's good for the community or if it's good for his wife or if it's good for his fucking children. All he cares about at the end of the day is you're paying his fucking bills at the end of the month. That's all he cares about. Well, I heard from, uh, oh shit, what's his name? The guy that started up the Boston Pizza. Yeah, G- yeah. Uh, he's a cop. Jim, Jim Triveling. Yeah, yeah, he's a cop. 
Yeah, he used to be RCMP. Yeah. Yep. So Jim Triveling, I read his book, and in his book, he gave me a, a, a theory of how he looks at money, his ideology around money. And each dollar is a soldier. That's, yeah. And you build an army of soldiers. Yeah. And then you'll, you don't want to put all your soldiers, you don't want to send all your soldiers off to war because if they all die, then you have nobody to defend your homeland. It's funny. That's almost how a gangster looks at it. But so you'll take a section of your army, you'll take a squadron yeah. of your dollars, of your soldiers, and, make and, them you'll, work. and you'll send them off to war and mm-hmm. investing in something is 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 battle because you don't know if they're coming home or not. I mean, but if they win, if they if it if it's successful, yeah. when they come home, they're bringing with them more yeah. soldiers. They yeah. just captivated another army and they're bringing that home and your army gets bigger and more powerful. And the more dollars you have, the bigger your army is and the more you can conquer and control. I I mean, I agree to that philosophy if that's the kind of business that you're going to go into. So meaning, sure, in the restaurant business or the franchisee business, it's very, very, it's very, very cutthroat. And there's a lot of blood that's, that, that hits the floor in that world because uh, there's not a lot of extra money to be spent in the, in the restaurant world use it, using that. But he's also, he also owns Mr. Lube, a whole bunch of stuff, right? So he's very much in the service, service uh, sales industry, okay? Um, and, and, and he's rightly so. I mean, you know, between him and the guy who owns Lubex, uh, they probably fought many, many times with their money. Uh, but at the end of the day, that's not necessarily true in every business. You know, like I said, there are those entrepreneurs out there who like making eighty, ninety thousand dollars $90,000 a year. And that's, that's all they want. Yeah. They, they don't want anything more than that. They just want to be their own boss. And they just want to be able to do what they do. Yeah. But, but then you know? it's still a, G, a J-O-B. Not if you like what you do, you know. Yeah, but eighty eighty thousand dollars is just over broke. Not in, today, re- in today's day and age, like you can you can maintain a healthy life and and have a comfort, pay for your family and everything like that, and, and squirrel away some savings for retirement. Maybe sure. you know what I mean. Well, I would look at it this way: if you go to the gym every day, busting your ass, ripping it up, right? You might be able to work out four days that week and then have to take two days off. And you may even hurt yourself if you go back in those two days that you should take off to, to rest. If you're making slushed $80,000 a year and you're recession proof, those guys, I'm telling you that right now, because I'm dealing with, I've dealt with this. Those guys who are making big bang bucks up and down, up and down, they still go down. When you're making $80,000 a, a year and you're recession proof. Yeah, yeah. Buddy, yeah. That's security. It's dividends. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's dividends. And if you can shrink that down to where you have a minuscule amount of time making that money, then, then you may be able to go off and, and do something from, else. Yeah. So it all depends. And this is why I say, I'm not saying, all I'm saying is be respectful of where you're at and just be honest with yourself. You know what I mean? Don't walk around like you're a million dollar man in, in grandiosism because you're not. Instead, represent who you are as what you are, and you're going to start loving the person that you're becoming. But what do I do about right? my shopping addiction? Yeah, that, that's, <laughs> that comes down. That could be a replacement of an addiction, right? Because we see that many times, right? Yeah. I've seen just the psychology of that. I've seen many guys go from uh, stimulant use to sex, stimulant use to food, stimulant l- use to, to shopping, stimu- stimulant l- uh, use to like fucking entrepreneurship. But you can't even say it's entrepreneurship because what ends up happening is these guys just piss their money away. You know, like, like they're just going from, they're just erratic. They're so erratic and irrational, right? That's what makes us effective as, as entrepreneurs when you can make your, er- your erratic movements rational and calculate it. See, the big thing that we, and I use this as a fighter, you know, like fighters, they, they're, they're very erratic in their life. They do crazy shit and it's so irrational, right? But that's what makes them effective as a fighter. They're the guy who'll come in there and, you know, fake you out with the left and then pop you one with the right. And you didn't even see it because you, you were blindsided or whatever, right? Mm-hmm. Entrepreneurs are the same, same kind of person. 
right? They're the person who is very erratic. And that's why business people like the guy who owns BPs doesn't like guys like us. The reason why he doesn't like guys like us is because if we have enough power and enough money and go into the restaurant business, we'll shake that fucking those for all of those franchises up, rattle it, get as much cash we can out of there and fucking run to the next thing. And he's battered because he just went, he was on and up and then we just brought him down. You know, that those guys don't like that. Those guys are the guys who really don't want to invest in an entrepreneur unless they're on his side. Right. They, they just don't want it. That's again, that guy who, like I said, looking at an investor, they're either pragmatic or they're greedy. And that guy has coined both sides of it. But if you're not greedy for him, he's not going to help you. And he's got enough power and influence to damage you before you even get off the dock. He owns the lake. <laughs> you know what I mean? So he won't even let you into the lake if he sees you coming. And this is why you have to be very, very careful in business. That's why you have to be quiet. You don't want to tell everybody what you're doing, you know, and building that relationship with those people back to that, that, that topic that we were at, you, you know, mums the word a lot of times in business. And when you create that, when you create that circle around you, those are the people that like me and this guy, this guy who's coming in next week. We talk about business plans all the time, but you know what we never do is we never get into competition with each other. And the reason why we don't compete against each other is because there's, there's no, there, there's no advancement in that. It's, it's, it's just, it's just, there's no point to it. It's better to collaborate with that guy because we're both coming from the same place than it is for us to fight each other and not move on to the next place that we're going to tomorrow. Right. That's why I always say anybody that I'm working with, look, and I'm not here to compete with you. Instead, we need to complement each other all the way through this process, right? And that's, that's a huge, huge deal, right? Uh, how are you uh, keeping and finding your motivation when you realize that you have to walk away from, my, from an idea? Um, there's always, there's always going to be opportunity and possibility, Okay. As long as that's your viewpoint. So that, that is a quintessential entrepreneurial ideology. Yeah. See, psychologists for years have been trying to figure out why we're so optimistic, even in the most grimmest circumstances. Right? I still don't have an answer for that. I'm not a psychologist, but I still don't have an answer for how it is or why it is that we are that optimistic and, and, and sometimes pretty shitty predicaments. I mean, I've had a gun to my head and I was still pretty optimistic that I was going to make it out of that situation. I mean, I shouldn't have been, but all my fingernails ripped out, all of my toenails ripped out, gun in my mouth. And I still in the back of my mind thought, no, this isn't it. You know, that's not something like, like most people are like, kiss my ass goodbye. <laughs> this guy doesn't have it in him. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. You know what I mean? Like I've, you're looking at yourself as a second person. You're like, I'm fucking done. You know, like nails are gone. Mouth is busted. <laughs> you know, like, like all that, all that would amount to I've given up in life, but there's something about entrepreneurs, right? And that's, that's almost, if you will entertain this, this, this road with me a little bit. What is that undying stop? Is it the hunger? Or is it the fact that I can't see life in any other way but this way? Well, like... Or is it something I, else that I'm not even seeing? You know? I can't even remember. I was really young, though, when I made the decision, like, cut and dry, that I didn't want to just be an employee. I didn't want to just be a cog in a wheel yeah. and like i must have been fucking like four years old when i came up with that belief system that i could create my own yeah and and, and be like a self-made success story i just believe in it I, I just told myself that's the way other people can do it so can i yeah. that's that yeah i i always thought i was going to be a professional like so i always i always would you know when you uh, play make belief with yeah. your cousins or yeah, whatever, yeah. right? So I would always assume the position as a, of a as a president, right, or or something of that kind yeah. of stature, yeah. right? Uh, 
never ever really knowing the process that it was going to take to get there. But I always knew that I would not be able to do one thing for the rest of my life. I knew that right from right from the get go. Like like I just wouldn't be able to do that. So so I kind of think I I fell in to this lifestyle this way. Did you ever read that book, The Racketeer? No. By by uh, Grisham. Oh yeah, maybe I might have. I might have when I was doing time. Yeah, yeah, that's when I read it. it was yeah. in jail. But that, like that was a that was a good book. And then at the end, like all this shit happened. Shit went shit went south. And you thinking that this guy just like bit the barrel. Everything he put all his effort into is gone. Yeah. But really, underneath it all, he he created another opportunity. He had an out. Spoiler alert. And then when he came, yeah, I know. And then at the end, when all this shit went to hell. He like came out on top and he capitalized on everybody else's losses because he formulated that option. He yeah. he created that option. Mm-hmm. And that's what we do as entrepreneurs is we create options. We yeah. create possibilities. Well, we're, we're very creative people, right? The the, the biggest piece and, and and this is the thing that like I'm going to harp I'm going to hit this one again with a hammer. This nail with a hammer again. We as entrepreneurs always get paralyzed and it becomes a paralysis about us doing anything because we don't know the legal side of things. Yes. that That's always the issue, right? We have all these ideas where we're like, fuck, why can't I just get it going? Well, because you're not, you're not paying the respect that it's worth in order to talk to a lawyer. And instead of coming up with the money to create a professional graphics logo or to get something drafted, or for this or for that, come with the money to go and consult with a lawyer for an hour, you know? And, and, and I mean, if there's any lawyer that I would suggest, again, it would be a Liam Connolly of Connolly Law. I mean, he's our lawyer. He's a great guy. And he knows corporate, corporate law, media law, inside and out, up and down. Like this guy, this guy really knows what he's talking about. And it's very, very much underutilized. You don't need a bloody business consultant. You don't need any of that as an entrepreneur. What you really need is to get that $1,000, drop it down on a lawyer, and say, how do we get this going legally? This is my idea. How do we get this going legally? A lawyer's never going to talk you out of it. You've paid for his services for $1,000. And that's it. That's all. They're, they're going to do their legal mumbo jumbo. And you're going to be able to then go to an insurance company and find out how much insurance is going to cost you. Or better yet, call the insurance company and say, look, this is the business idea. Can you give me a rough estimate of what insurance is going to cost me? And then you start building what your overhead looks like. Right. That, that's, it's a big deal. Anybody who you want to go pitch to, they're going to ask you, what are your monthly bills? Because I want to make sure I'm getting my money out of this, too. Right. I mean, if, if you're if, if you're spending almost 90 percent in overhead and claiming nothing in your gross, you're, you're screwed. You know, that it's everything going in. So, again, why why is the podcast a great business for us to be in? Well, no overhead. There's no overhead. None. Rent. Studio. That's it. Yeah. And then but you don't need it. And then and then there's there's also lips and like you do have to have a syndication things of this nature, but it's not as expensive as what people think it is. I'm not saying that any Tom, Dick and Harry should go out and do a podcast. What I'm saying is, is, is if you have something to provide, provide it. Yeah. Go out there and do it. Yeah. You know, this, this is a great, especially in the Canadian market. This is, this is a great new underutilized medium that the radio is very, very afraid of. They're very afraid of this medium. You know, I've already seen the corporate media slashing um, sales percentages on their marketing on their marketing staff because they can't they can't pay they can't pay their bills. That's that's where they're at. You know, I, I mean, is that a success of the internet or is that a success of the time and the fact that we're evolving? Well, speaking of internet and like anybody who's an entrepreneur, the internet is the catalyst for limitless opportunities to start a, your own business in whatever the fuck you want. 100%. If you want to design paper cups and you want to put fancy labels on paper cups and you come up with a cool picture, you can figure that out on the internet and you can set it up so you can ship these paper cups with your cool logo on it all over the fucking world without ever even touching them. The, the biggest, so the, pragma, the pragmatic side of me will say this. You need to look at the saturation of that market that you're looking at. Absolutely. You have to be honest about it. If it's saturated, what I would 
warn you against is to not sit there and say, I'm the one in a million though. And even though the, it's saturated to a uh, hundred billion people doing this, my one in a million is going to outshine all of them. Cause, cause, cause this is the kicker in that saturation. You're going to have massive money like Walmart in it. And you're going to have massive because they're all changing. All these Walmart, Sears, all these people, they didn't go anywhere just because they closed their stores. They've like their physical stores. They evolved. Okay. You're talking about little you going up against it with a corporation who's trying to look like a little you, but they really have hundreds and hundreds of billions of dollars ready to go into war with you. Just like that guy from, from Boston pizza. That's what they're ready to do. So they're playing like they're a little you, but they're not a little you. Yeah, because they're a smart car, but they got a Hayabusa engine in it. Because the, the, <laughs> because the piece is, is everybody wants to look organic and they all want to look like they're their own. They want to look personal. You know, one of the reasons why the podcast is so successful is because you and I are not playing. We're not playing characters here. We're not radio hosts. You know, that's, that's, that's why this is popular. Yeah. We are us. Yeah. It's organic and it, and it, and it's individual of its own self. Right. So what do you think Sears is trying to do right now? You know how many people are actually employed by Sears and they're just like Miss Maggie over there has her own clothing company. Right. That that's what they're doing. It's not Miss Maggie. It's Sears. <laughs> That's what it is. It's Sears, right? And Miss Maggie is basically drop uh, drop shipping for them. Yeah, that's basically what she's doing. Yeah, you know, generating really, traffic. Yeah, you you really you really want to know who who owns Amazon? It's Alibaba. Alibaba is the wholesale of Amazon, and all the stuff that you're buying off Amazon, somebody has bought in from Alibaba, put up an ad on Amazon and they're the distributor and that person is claiming 15% of every sale without ever having to warehouse any of the things that they're selling. You just have to be able to look at the market, see how saturated it is and try to be ahead of the curve within the market that Amazon has created. Yeah. Just get on, get on the front end of something that's trending. So we've never, so now instead of having one great big Sears who used to be that they would go out and they would shop for all these things and then put it in a store and people would go to those stores and, and that's how they disseminated what they were selling. But now our, all the stores are online and you just turn on your computer. And you and I are the disseminators. And any Joe and Schmuck out there thousands. can be. Yeah, yeah, there's thousands, but that's the thing to recognize. There's, there's millions upon millions of people disseminating. Okay. And, and it's that's why like human and, services, like face to face stuff or like counseling stuff, like we're never going to be counseled by a fucking robot. No, you know what I mean? But, but it, in regards to the Amazon thing, uh, there's pirates. People will block up your account and rob you. That happens all of the time on there. I kid you not it happens all of the time. Right. And who, who, what place are you going to? This person who's robbing you is in like, God knows what country. There, there, there is no, there, there is no, I mean, Amazon will try to get you the money back, but big deal. That's, that's one of the crimes that's happening in that job. But they, again, they just lock you out of your own business and fucking done the, and they'll just pump it. And they just jack and your they, phone. And they, yeah. Basically <laughs> they, what happens, they right? jack your drug phone no, and, and then, and then chop all your custies. So, so in saying that, like I said, there's hundreds of millions of people in that, in that industry. You need to seriously look at how, how saturated it, how saturated you, like what you are selling, whatever you're selling. If there's so many things being sold in Instagram, like for instance, those rollers, your dog and its cats, your dog, your cat and the kittens and puppies are selling bloody rollers right now. Those fitness rollers. Those foam rollers? Yeah. Don't, oh my God, go get yourself a foam roller. But don't get into selling it. Don't get into selling it because everybody's selling it. Look at the curve. Where are people going next? What's the next thing that they're going to want? That's what you got to look at. Because to be the first 50 or first 100,000 now in that at Amazon, you're going to make money. 
But to be even the middle of the 50 million that are selling it, you're not making a dime because the competition is too stiff. It's too saturated. And that's not worth your time. Instead, you're better off to invest your time in where is it going? Yeah, but like that takes a ton of time researching what Amazon is. Hundred percent, hundred percent. But like outside of the uh, merchant uh, spectrum, like outside of the merchant industry where you're selling people products, sure. right? Even like whatever life struggle that anybody has gone through, and I'm just saying this for encouragement for somebody out yeah. there who's just struggling on what to do. There's a struggle that you've gone through in your life that you know better than anybody else. You've gone through it. You made it out the other side alive and well. Mm -hmm. And it's that information, those tools and skills, those coping mechanisms, that process that you utilized at that time that you can turn a profit on, that you can sell, that you can provide people and increase the val the their quality of life and in return, they will pay you for it. And the internet is the perfect platform to do anything on, to sell anything to the world. So f for anybody out there that just has like a spark of creativity in them, just, you know, rack your brain and your heart for a memory of something where you came out on top after a fucking battle and use that information to create a service or a product to provide to other people because other people have gone through the same struggle or are going through it right now. I also think too, um, anybody can start a podcast, but you want to be, I'll put it to you this way too. This is the other side to podcasting. That you got a year worth of volunteering <laughs> in you. <laughs> well, I think, I think one of the things about podcasting that people don't appreciate is, or any media that's coming out is when your stuff is published is published more so in the geographical location that you're in as much as it's the world wide web and everybody's around the world the fact of the matter is is the the most direct uh exposure that you have is your hashtags of where you are geographically right like like your hashtag of uh you know yeg where, wherever you are that's where you're going to generate your base to begin with and then it's going to go from internet word of mouth and create from there where did right? those like three letter well, all comes from it, the plane it comes from the airports right yeah and, like how they because it fits within it fits within the hatch hashtag uh, high frequency longer your hashtags are the less frequent it's going to be yeah yeah so the shorter the shorter it is the more frequent you're going to get anyways that's it for us we so went way over time today or what or not way over time end? but a little bit a little bit so if you want to wrap it up all right y'all Thank you for listening. Yeah. Uh, please subscribe, share with all your friends, put it on your Facebook, your Instagram, your LinkedIn, your Twitter. Talk about Life on Life's Terms podcast. If you're Googling it, Google Life on Life's Terms Canada. You'll come up with all our information. Uh, you can find the After the Show blog and more information. You can find Chelsea's blog uh, on www.lifeonlifestermspodcast.com. You can become a Pride member at your soonest convenience. We'd really appreciate it because we want to grow our tribe. This is this is by uh, by the people for the people. You yeah. know what I mean? Like we're generating value, everyday life experiences, and your input matters. Become a Pride member. We do not sell your email. No. So we don't sell it to anybody who's a asks us for the email list we just deny them the only reason why we ask you for your email is that you can become a pride member and essentially we can tell you when upcoming shows are, are coming as well as events speaking events uh we may be or when we go live because that will be probably happening in the very near future or anything maybe that maybe you have a business that you want to bring on the show yeah and get some uh exposure to the world yeah you know, hit us up. Yeah, for sure. Uh, if you'd like to become a financial contributor, we do have a Patreon page, www.patreon, that's P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com slash capital L, life on capital, <laughs> life on life's terms, both L's are capitalized. So that's www.patreon.com slash life on life's terms, both L's are capitalized. A contribution of as little as $5 a month will 
guarantee you a spot in the tribe and family. Yeah. And we'll send you all the content, all our content early. Not all right. of it, but we'll send you some stuff early. I fucked that right up. That's okay. <laughs> Thanks for listening, everybody. Love ya. Have a wonderful Friday.